Welcome everyone. Uh, this is another episode of our bi-weekly webinar. We have our acquisition manager, Joshua Harmon, who also own his own real estate broker company, brokerage firm. And he's like the number one commercial broker in our, in our town. And uh, so he had the uh, multiple millions of transactions every year. And so far, is giving us great deals and there's a lot of things that happens behind the scene also he underwrites every single day sometimes multiple times a day and send out letter of intents for us almost every week and most of those like 99 percent of them are not working out because of the we're not the numbers are not working based on the interest rate and also the sellers not ready to make a deal. But we've seen a shift in the market. Josh is gonna go over some pointers for people trying to also buy their own real estate property, people that want to be brokers, and also for just regular investors, right? Even if you're a passive investor, it's important to understand the state of the market how the deals are being sought and understanding multiple parts of the syndication process allow you to be a better investor, right? So if you know how to do a little bit of underwriting, you know how people find deals, how profits have been distributed, some financing, so you'll be a better overall investor. Without further ado, I'm going to give it to Josh and then, yeah. Impress us. <laughs> Thank you, Bio. I really appreciate it. Bio and George has set up an a awesome platform to just spend an hour or so for getting a better understanding of the business. It's great to listen to podcasts. It's great to listen to YouTube videos, but to get proximity to people that you actually know and you have access to is game changing. So I appreciate it, you guys. Onboarding was great. The platform was great. I really appreciate it. So I'll get right into it. My name is Joshua Harmon Sr. I just want to spend a few minutes getting you guys familiar about who I am and how I got in the business and where I am today. So I'm originally from Richmond, Virginia, born and raised, thought basketball would take me to the places that real estate is going to take me, but it didn't work out that way, right? Six, five, jump out the gym. When you get to college, other guys can jump out of the gym too. <laughs> Quickly learned towards the middle of my college career at University of Arkansas, Fort Smith, that hey, you're not going to play professional basketball. And if you do, you'll likely be making 30 grand in El Salvador and Mexico <laughs> with free room and board. So quickly had to shift my junior year of college, found out that I was having my first uh, child, Audrey, who's my oldest. She's my pride and joy. Knew that she was going to be the one that changed my life. And she did. Quickly went into sales. My senior year of college, sat down with my coach, said, hey, I'm having a kid, um, not really sure where. I can make some money to support her. And he said, hey, if you can think you can go to AT&T and make some money, you should go do that because I had a job offer on the table to do sales. Never done sales before that other than just hand-to-hand -hand selling shoes or doing things like that to make some extra money in school. So actually sat out my senior year, didn't play basketball, just went to school, paid my own tuition as opposed to being on full scholarship for the first three years to work at and thinking I was going to make, you know, 30, 40 grand. Ended up being one of the top salesmen in the country, right? Out of 25,000 sales reps, I was top five every month for over a year in sales, right? So when they first acquired DirecTV, that was the push, sell DirecTV. So I did really well, right? Quickly went into management. They took away the sales commissions that, that I got spoiled by. And as an assistant manager, I was put in the leadership role at 23 years old. And if you guys have any children or any nephews or cousins at 23 years old, they're not very mature, right? They have no business leading a group of a, a sales team, right? They have no business doing that. Neither did I. So quickly transitioned into uh, trying to look for different avenues for me to get back into sales and landed on being a realtor at 23 years old. <laughs> 23 years old, started selling houses. Didn't have a lot of fun doing it, but always knew that I wanted to be in the commercial real estate space. Something about apartments always drew to me. I uh, felt like I just always had this vision that I was going to be a real estate investor somehow, some way. Didn't know anybody who was big in that space. 
I just always knew I was going to own apartments. I don't know why. But this was my opportunity, get into that space in sales. So instead of selling houses, I wanted to sell apartments. And I remember telling my broker, hey, look, I know it's my first year, but I want to sell apartment complexes. And I vividly remember, I'll never forget this day. It was one of the life-changing moments in my life. He said, hey, there's just not enough apartment complexes for you to sell in Fort Smith, Arkansas. You probably just want to sell houses like I'm telling you to do. And I said, I, I don't know about that. I challenged them on that because that's just my personality. It's not, it's a problem solver, right? No matter what industry I'm in, I want to solve a problem. So I was pretty much the only person in the Fort Smith market at that time, 2017, 2018, selling apartment complexes. And I actually started to buy a couple as well with partners, right? Just finding people in bigger pockets. Hey, I found this deal. Direct to seller, would you partner with me? You put up the cash, we'll be 50 50. All right. I did a couple of those deals before I was 25 years old, but I started to sell them. And that was really where the education came in at. 2017, 2018, we're getting out of the, re the recession, I would say. Sales started to uptick. You started to see syndicators. The space started to blow up a little bit. And our little town started to see some traction as well. So, started off my first year selling, probably only sold two or three million. And over the course of my career, I've sold over 100 million. Just me, no team, no back office, no admin, um, just me, right? I've sold a lot of apartment complexes. A lot of the deals that come across uh, the market in Arkansas and Oklahoma, they come through my email first. I've seen them, I underwrote them, I gave them some guidance, I decided to list it or I passed. And you know, then those deals come out to the market for you guys to see. Today, I own just over 300 apartment units. I still have my real estate brokerage, Harmon Real Estate Company. I don't really track volume anymore. It's just not really my focus right now. So I couldn't even tell you where our sales are this year, but we're doing well. We're doing well. And my focus today is finding deals and building verticals within my investing team, right? Asset management. We do property management of our own portfolio and then acquisition. So that's where my focus is today. And so hopefully they gave you a little bit of context of who I am. And now I want to talk a little bit about where we are in the market. How can you find undervalued opportunities? I feel like a lot of you folks either want to be an investor, active investor for your own portfolio, or you want to be a passive investor. Either way, you need to understand how these deals are being found, right? Because if you want to play actively, you have to get out there. It's going to be guys like me. That's going to be guys like Wes, who's on this call, who are calling sellers direct, right? We are your competition. So if you want to compete with us, you got to know what you're doing and you got to know how to, you got to create time to go out there and find these sellers, find these brokers, and then know how to underwrite quickly. Because the last thing you want to do is finally find a deal and then spend 60 days on it. <laughs> and then you miss out because you took too much time. The undervalue opportunities today are in that 50 and below space, I believe. And then also that 100 to 200 space. That small to medium sized apartment complex is really where a lot of the opportunity is. And the reason being, I believe, is because you're not going to see a lot of REITs playing there. You're not going to see a lot of institutions playing there. You're going to see a lot of just single operators or small groups who feel that financial distress that's in the market. Not so much that they're going to lose their property, but hey, this deal is actually pulling me back from having peace of mind or or it's just sucking out a lot of our cash reserves. A lot of the, we, me and George and Bio were talking before you guys got on, a lot of people watching news headlines about people losing their properties and this mass hysteria that's going to happen in the market. There's very specific pockets in the market that bought wrong in the last cycle that are going to lose their properties. And I'll tell you what those pockets are. Those DFW areas, Sunbelt, Phoenix, California, some of those bigger markets where you see small syndication groups that didn't raise enough reserves, they did, they did the adjustable rate mortgage, or they did the, they did a, what you call it, they just, they just bought bad debt, right? They didn't know what they were getting into. But you, most of the space is owned by REITs and institutions. Those people are well capitalized. If you guys knew how much money these folks had just sitting in their bank accounts, all right, now they're looking at their pro portfolio as a whole. Those aren't the groups that are going to lose their deals. You need to go direct to a seller or a small syndication group that is seeing some distress. The folks that aren't sending down investor 
uh, emails. They haven't been sending out distributions for 18 months. They're not updating their investors at all. Something that you guys can do is speak to your other passive investors. Say, hey, look, have you had some operators who aren't communicating with you? Are you have are you seeing some situations where you haven't got distributions in almost 24 months, 18 months, 12 months? Hey, what's going on there? You can also reach out to your local attorneys, your local accountants. Hey, I know you don't, you can't tell me any information about your clients, but do you know any clients that may be interested in selling their properties? Right? So reaching out to property managers. Hey, do you have some clients in your portfolio that are having some issues that may be interested in selling their properties? Right? That's a trick that I just pulled recently. Hey, I heard it was a guy who was having some financial distress. I reached out to his property manager that he fired and said, hey, would you be interested in reaching out to this owner who may have some properties that he would sell? I got my eyes on a specific property. You think he would sell it? He usually doesn't answer the phone for me. So I sent somebody else to talk to him, talk to him. And guess what? He's like, yeah, let's play ball. I've asked him for site plans. It's a newer construction property, A class. Asked for site plans, asked for rent roll. I'm seeing, I'm seeing holes all in the, the, the information they're sending to me. And now I'm seeing distress. You start to uncover some distress. And those are the owners and the sellers that you're going to be able to do a deal with that have some level of distress. If you're buying a deal where there's no distress at all, you're probably not buying a good deal. I'm going to be honest with you. Me and Bio go back and forth all the time because Bio is very results driven. It's either you did, either you're sending me deals or you're not sending me deals. But when I tell them, hey, unless we're getting a 16 to 20% discount on a deal, we can't make them work. Some of the larger markets, you need a 20% discount. That's what I'm hearing in the DFW areas. You need a 20% discount from where sellers are asking today. Here locally in Arkansas and Oklahoma, it isn't as bad. I'm seeing that you need about a 16% discount. Anywhere between 14 to 16% is what I've been seeing on every deal is what I need. We were looking at a, a deal that just recently hit the market in the Tulsa area. They're posting coming soon. I'm like, bio, we, we ran that deal three months ago and we needed a 15% discount with preferred equity to get investor returns. And they're blowing this deal out. It's the next deal coming, right? Somebody's going to buy it. Somebody's going to bleed on it. They're not going to be able to sell it on their exit and they're going to underperform. So how do you find the under, undervalue opportunities? Follow the breadcrumbs with distress in your local markets. You don't have, I would advise a lot of you guys to invest somewhere locally where you are so you can build those really good relationships. I'm building here in the Fort Smith area, Arkansas and Oklahoma. I'm building those verticals out, but I'm already scoping out my next market. I'm looking at markets that are hour and a half flight for me and how I can take it to the next level. Because I've already set up all the traps here to be successful. I don't need to set up any more traps. I know the people to call. I know who has the stress. I know who owns what. So I know how we're going to get to the next level. But after that, I'm already setting up traps for the next market, right? But you guys who are trying to get into active investing and building your own portfolios, do it in your backyard. Bio asks me all the time, bro, why don't you go out a little bit? Look for some deals somewhere else. Like I could, and I get those deals and I look at them, but I'm telling you, we can hit our goals here locally within a, a two hour radius. We don't have to go to those hot markets to be successful, all right? I'll tell you guys, definitely get in contact with your local vendors, your lawyers, your, your attorneys. You want to get in contact with those property managers. You want to get in contact um, with those accountants, those CPAs who are doing these false taxes, right? They know these people aren't being profitable that they're not sending out distributions, that they're bleeding money, that they're pulling out money of their personal funds to pay property taxes. Like they know, and they'll give you hints because they want to help those people. So those are where some of the undervalued opportunities are. If you're looking at some deals that are, you definitely want to find some needles in the haystack that have value add, right? Like we all want to, you can't buy a deal today that doesn't have any value add component. Value add doesn't mean that it's heavily physically distressed. But I was rolling out an A plus, A plus class property in Kansas City that you guys will get a chance to see. The value add play there is to just take it to the next level. Value add doesn't mean that you have to tear it down to the studs. I've done some, my average price per unit on renovations is about 13,000 per unit. We've got 315 units. Renovating every single one of them. The average price per unit on renovations, I'll say again, is $13,000. That's a lot of renovations, right? 
So I'm shifting a little bit because deliveries are slow. Contractors are seeing the distress too, right? Everybody's seeing the distress. So let's start looking at some of the A-class stuff like bio's about to roll out. And hey, we're just working on the business. The resident, the resident class is already there, right? All of the, all the, all the positives are there. All you need to do is just professionalize, streamline things and take it to the next level. Give the people what they want. And that doesn't always take that 13,000 per unit that I'm spending. So go ahead, bio. No, just wanted to say, sorry, if you have any questions, you can type it into the comment section and then we're going to ask it or you can raise up your hand since we're not too many people and you can actually come on video and ask the questions too, but we'll call you. Go ahead, Josh. Awesome. Yeah. One thing that I would say is you guys should start looking at some of the nicer units, right? If you see a developer right now building something or they've been in the process of building something. You definitely want to build that relationship right now. You definitely want to build that relationship because those folks have to refinance their debt, right? And they're refinancing into a 9%, right? The refine, refine into a 9% could be a cash in instead of the cash out that they projected. That's something that I'm looking at right now as well. And then just folks who are not operators. This is the operator, operator's market right now. If you get into a deal, any of you guys wanted to do active investing, you definitely want to first and foremost, have the, the systems in place to operate because you have to operate your butt off to be successful right now. This isn't a market where you can buy something and the basis isn't as low as it used to be, right? Wes can attest to this. In our market, if you weren't buying something for 25 grand a door a few years ago, people looked at you nuts. What the heck are you doing? <laughs> You're spending over 25 grand a door. Those are some of the people that the headlines will say are going to lose their property. Their basis is too low to lose their property. This is, it's just not going to happen. Their, their basis is low. They don't have to charge the same rents that all of us have to charge. And they're just coasting. But if you can find some folks that, if you can find some properties where you feel you can operate it, what I'm looking at a lot today is townhomes, some of the larger unit sizes, right? Because I'm seeing that the price per door on those rents is significantly higher than just your two-bedroom flat. If I can find a two-bedroom townhome, I'm running towards that deal right now. I'm seeing a significant rent premium in those units. So in, I just closed a 24-unit. Wes probably hadn't even seen this deal. Closed a 24-unit about two weeks ago. All townhome units, average unit size is about 1,200 square feet. And they're charging about $0.60 cent a square foot on rent. I can easily get it up to a dollar, but I'm probably going to, if I can get it to about 80 cents a square foot, I'm going to be super successful and we're going to double our money in two years. So you guys find a deal out there where you can charge 80 cents a square foot and double your money in two years and we'll buy it. <laughs> we'll buy it. It was also an owner financing component to that deal. The seller actually financed 20% and we still had to put down another what, 10% down with the bank. So we're about 35% or 65% leverage on that deal, LTV, to get that deal done. Luckily, the seller was willing to hold 20% of that for us. And we still, with that owner finance, are going to double our money in two years. So those are the type of deals that you want to find today, right? Those are the deals that work. We didn't necessarily get a huge discount from that 15% discount, but we were able to get some, some help with that owner finance where it was an interest only component to that as well. So it worked out for us very well. But yeah, those, those are some of the, the, what I'm seeing out there right now. I'm not seeing the mass hysteria with distress. Some of the headlines are showing. Could that happen? Absolutely. The Fed can do some, can make a few plays that can put everybody in distress, honestly. But the places that you're going to see the heavy distress that you're seeing in the headlines, to be honest, are some of those markets where a lot of the education groups are right? Dallas, Sunbelt, Arizona, um, California, right? The coastal areas. Those were a lot of the students went. They went and bought, they bought on bridge debt. They don't have enough capital. If, if let's just say their, their interest rate cap was 70 grand and they projected that. You guys, I still have webinars saved from 2017 all the way through 2022. And all of them talked about this bridge that was so awesome. And we're being conservative. We're being conservative. How many, raise your hand if you've heard conservative, my conservative underwriting with bridge debt. 
right? Everybody's trying to be conservative, but I was actually listening to a guy recently and I I think he's very smart. He says, I do realistic underwriting. I don't do conservative underwriting, right? Realistic underwriting. Because if you really step back and you look at the product, how much different was that product from 2007, 2008, adjustable rate mortgages? How much different was it? Well, you guys tell me in the chat if you think there's a huge difference from it. It just isn't. My entire portfolio is, is leveraged with community bank debt. That's fixed for five years. A lot of times it's 80% loan to value or 75% loan to value. I would say that's conservative. You buying on bridge debt, that's variable rate, and you had to buy a cap every year or every two years in order to fix your debt. Yeah, it's not that much different. Now, of course, they're not plumbers with, with multiple homes, right? But hey, look, a lot of these folks were brand new. If you really dive deep on some of these general, these GPs and their backstory, they're just like me, right? I told you my backstory. I was a sales guy. I got into being a broker and now I transitioned to investing. How much do you think my net worth was when I started investing? It's probably negative <laughs> with student loan debt, right? I was probably negative net worth when I started in 2017. So were these guys, right? And they just made some decisions that I don't think were 100% future thinking, it was right now. How do we get this deal? How do we get in the game? And they got caught, right? But George, you can, you're can you a passive investor in a lot of deals. You tell me what other options were out there to get into the game in 2020, 2021, and 2022, other than bridge debt. What was the other option? Yeah, it's a question I've been asking um, a lot of my mentors and people a lot smarter than me. I was just really curious because there was so much variable rate debt and it's we just completely forgot about 2008 2007 same thing but it was just a different market it was just individuals with their personal residences getting into these adjustable rate mortgages but it's really the same thing as soon as those rates adjusted up people got in distress but that is what flooded the market over the last i don't know three four five years and I'm really curious as to why it couldn't have been anything else. And I think that's what we were talking about before uh, we started. Just why wasn't there more fixed rate debt in these bigger markets? There were in the smaller markets. And I'm curious, I, for anyone who may know on the lending side, I'm curious if lenders saw the risk and the, the risk horizon and what were they incentivized to do? Were they aware that this was potentially going to be a problem? Did they still give out these variable rate loans, even despite that, that risk, or were they just prohibited or for whatever reason, couldn't give out fixed rate debts like they were in the smaller communities? If anyone has any insights on that or wants to, you know, share about that, I'm very curious. While we wait for somebody, I'll tell you this, if you wanted to play in that time period, there was no other way, right? You had to take some risk. Right. And it was a lot of folks who went from zero to three thousand, zero to two thousand, zero to ten thousand units. And that's how they were able to do it. But one thing I tell you guys, even if you do bridge debt today, it's not a bad thing as long as you have it planned. Right. Like you just got to be smart about your business plan. When I was talking to George and Bio, they, they're in investor relations. This is what they do. Their job is my job is to bring the deal to the table. Their job is to make sure the investors are, are being given everything that we promised. They're getting communication, they're getting reports, they're getting their distributions, they're getting everything that they need. And they'll tell you this, if you do bridge debt, it's okay, as long as the business plan makes sense and we can deliver. You're pushing the NOI, your construction is being done on time, right? Because one thing that you'll have on those fixed rate Fannie um, and Freddie products and with community bank debt is you got yield maintenance, right? So let's just say we're surviving until 25, right? We're doing our deal. We're doing great. Our, our interest rate cap on our bridge debt doesn't expire till it has three years on it, right? Let's just say 2024, the market turns around. Interest rates go down for some reason. Those guys can't sell who have, the, who have yield maintenance in those fixed rate products because your prepayment can be equally as high as the interest rate cap, Right. Some people are spending a million dollars on the interest rate cap on a $15 million deal. They raised $10 million, but the interest rate cap is another mil. Imagine you guys doing a deal and then they're coming back to the your GP or your uh, sponsors coming back and saying, hey, look, 
group, I need a million bucks. We, we, we didn't raise enough. I need a million dollars from you. You're going to look crazy at that guy, right? You will also look crazy at your, you, you, would, you would not be happy with your sponsor if they came back and we have an opportunity to sell. And they say, hey, look, we're taking a million dollars out of the proceeds for yield maintenance. I'm sorry. We just didn't know about it. So it's all about the plan, right? How are you doing your underwriting? How are you putting your deal together? And that's what's most important right now. Not being conservative, it's being realistic. This is what's going on in the market. This is what we're projecting things to look like here in the future. And here's the business plan, right? This is the deal. It's well thought out. It's not just about the property level. It's talking about the future. It's thinking about right now. It's thinking about interest rate caps, prepayments, yield maintenance. Let's think about everything. Right. Hey Josh, I had a question about the yeah. discounts that you're seeing in smaller yeah. markets, even yeah. with the fixed rate debts, some of these sellers, are they still subject to these cap rate expansions from the Fed rate hikes? And are you still seeing discounts for those particular properties as opposed to the ones who are in more distress with variable rate loans? Not as much. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not seeing a lot of discounts there. I am seeing more opportunities and people come into play, right? There's more sellers coming to the table and they're willing to talk, right? They're not going to give you a 15 to 16% discount, right? It just, it's probably not going to happen on the smaller deal, but also on the smaller deal, you have more wiggle room, right? You don't have as much stress with, it makes more, it's a lot more digestible, right? If you're doing, for example, I bought a 12 unit deal in 2022. Right. Bought it in 2022, heavily distressed, needed 15,000 per unit on the interior. I spent another five grand per door on exterior. So I'm about 20 grand per door into this deal. Right. Fixed it, renovated, forced depreciation, renovated the entire property in 12 months. I projected to sell it at about 750. Appraisal a year ago, my as it completed appraisal was only 675. But I knew, hey, if I push the cap rate, this is just what the cap rate shows me. I know I'm going to get seven fifty. I'm, I'm going to close that deal and I'm going to sell it for seven hundred and five thousand. Wes knows this deal. Um, selling it for seven hundred and five thousand on Monday, right? It's a local chicken farmer, right? Like him and his wife, they're buying the deal. I'm going to double my money, actually two point three x my money in a year. Why wouldn't I do that deal? Now that's not a twenty percent discount. That's probably like a eight or nine percent discount from what I thought I was going to get, but that's a great deal for you guys to do right now. Look for those opportunities. Somebody who's got a nice property on the market, right? Negotiate with them, talk to them. You know, hey, this is my underwriting. Share it with them. I know you're wanting the seven fifty. Somebody would have showed me their underwriting. Hey, I know you want seven fifty. This is my underwriting. These are my rental comps. My property manager looked at it. I shopped the comps personally. I'm just coming up with seven hundred, right? I would have looked at their underwriting. I would have looked at my proceeds at closing and I may have negotiated with them and maybe I've done a deal, but it just happened to be a chicken farmer, right? That, those are deals that you guys can get done today. Actual deals that I'm doing right now. I'm going to 2.3x two, two, 2 my money. It's a deal that I've turned around in less than a year, of just around a year, maybe 13 months. I'm a two, I would get all of my passive. I had a partner on that deal. We bought three properties together. He's getting his initial capital out on all of our deals in this one transaction. So anything we do in our other two properties, just icing on the cake, we may never sell those. So those are opportunities that are out there right now. Those small deals, they don't have to sell, right? It's, it's easier to manage a 12 unit, a 20 unit, a 30 unit. It's really hard to financially come up with a million dollars on a 150 unit deal in DFW, where you got an interest rate cap, right? It is hard to do that. So those guys may be in trouble at some point, right? And those are some of the, the deals that are happen, happening right now. Very little of them, but there are some. The smaller deal is you're not going to just get a 20. You can't just go up to a guy and say, hey, look, I know you want a million bucks. I'll give you 800K and they just take it. Unless something's really going on, right? Like they got taxes due tomorrow, <laughs> right? So you're not going to just get a discount on a deal like that. But show them your underwriting. You do your research and figure out where they're where they are, are underperforming. If they got distressed, they're probably underperforming too. Right. So look at do your research, do your underwriting, just as if you're going to purchase it. Show them your underwriting. Show them your rental comps. 
and they're going to be more willing to play with you. I see Wes is is off cam on camera. Do you have a comment, Josh? No, I had a, okay. No, he's just he's dead on. Uh, the smaller deals, people are able to put more money down and make the numbers work. Bigger things are just tougher right now. And what about this rise in popularity of the loan assumption? Comparing that to just buying the deal outright at a higher interest rate, putting more money down. What are you seeing? What do you, what would you recommend to folks on here when they have those two options to try to get into deals today? Yeah. Bio and George, they'll tell you, I've been tracking this 70 plus unit deal here locally. What's going to be a loan assumption and over a million dollars of preferred equity. The seller is going to stay in the deal with us and allow us to assume their loan. Unfortunately, we actually helped them less than a year ago with buying one of their deals. So they didn't really need to sell, right? So they're going to hang on. But at the end of the day, the loan assumption is a very good idea right now. If you can find somebody who is underperforming on a agency loan, I'm sure Bio and, and George has had somebody on here who can tell you how difficult it is to number one, get an agency loan. You have to have liquidity. You have to have a track record, right? They're not going to just give you that loan. So also, they're not going to just allow you to assume that either as a sole investor. You need to find a group and a tribe of investors that you're investing with. So you can, number one, be able and qualified to assume one. But if you can, you have a group, you have a tribe that you're running with. You guys are looking for deals. You ladies are looking for deals together. You can get a 4% interest rate today, a 3% interest rate, a 5% interest rate. Sometimes they will have some interest only remaining on that deal, right? Now, one thing you do want to look out for when you're looking at a loan assumption, let's just say you're going to buy the property for $5 million and they only owe two and a half. Well, you have to raise two and a half million dollars and you're going to have a really low LTV, right? You're going to be 15%, 50% leveraged on that deal, but then you have to look at the investor return as well. Are you going to be able to deliver returns on a 15% LTV type of deal? So when you're doing a loan assumption, they're going to, the seller's going to think he's doing you a favor, right? She's doing you a favor. They're not going to now give you a discount on the price too, unless they have distress. So we just, that's, that's exactly why I brought it up. Yep. So we roll back to distress. That's really what you have to find right now. You have to hunt for distress. You need to get with the tribe of investors. You need to have a story. You need to be building your investor list. You need to be building your team and you need to have somebody on your team, if not all of you on the hunt for distress. Where's the distress? Who needs help? Who can I talk to? Who can I help? That's the place you need to come from. You're not going to get something in 2007, 2008, like they did where everything was foreclosed, right? A lot of people say, if I was investing in 2007, 2008, I would have bought everything. But guess what? Nobody was buying anything in 2007 and 2008. Nothing was happening. Nobody was doing deals. So today, the fact that we have the opportunity to still do deals I think this is the biggest wealth transfer ever, right? This next swing in the market. So I'm not, I don't care about real estate volume in my brokerage. I don't care how much cash I have in the bank. I don't care about what clothes I have on, how cool my car looks. I'm pushing towards a specific number of units. Bio knows what it is. I won't tell everybody, but it's a very big number. And this is going to be the swing that we, I set myself up for that. And you guys should be doing the same. This is the biggest wealth transfer ever, right? It's a lot of stuff going on in the market. There was a lot of bad practices in the last cycle. And it's time to capitalize. To be honest with you guys, that's what's going on right now. I see Temi has a question asking, can you speak to the difference between loan assumption and the subject to? I'm yeah. actually going to start with that, actually. So this has been asked a lot in the group, in the investment group about loan assumption, right? So in a loan assumption, the buyer takes over the existing mortgage, right? As part of the purchase of the property. Not only are you just getting the, so you take a loan assumption. The major problem there is that you have to pay off their equity usually because it tends to end up leading to high money debt situation, which Josh will explain later, which happens. That's why we have to do the preferred equity. Uh, on top of that deal. But with subject to, you're not actually taking responsibility of the mortgage outright. You're not taking, you take ownership of the property, 
but you don't assume the mortgage. And the subject to the mortgage remains on the seller. But you pay, then you as a buyer then pays it you know, for them. So you have to be in super distress. I know Pace Mobi do this a lot, but it's like a level of distress for you to agree to a subject to. But it's a strategy. And I know Wes actually does this actually <laughs> a lot. Yeah. So appreciate you giving some insight on that bio. I hope that gave some insight on the difference between subject to and assumption. One thing that I will implore you guys, I see a lot of, and I hate to even do this, but I see a lot of black and brown people on this webinar. And I want you guys to really focus and listen to what I'm saying and take this the right way. We've all, we all have a really unique opportunity right now. I remember getting in the business in 2017 and feeling like I was the only one. Like I had, I just didn't see anybody doing what I was doing. They didn't look like me. They didn't talk like me. And one thing that I've learned along the way is if you want to be at the top, no matter what you look like and what your background is, you have to start speaking and learn the terminology of a sophisticated investor, right? Loan assumption, debt, not a mortgage. You want to talk about cap rates. I've got a book in here. I'm going to probably give you guys some book rec recommendations as well. Once we, once I get a second, I'll, I'll send that out to you guys. But I want you guys to really understand the terminology, right? The one thing that makes me successful today is when a seller approaches me or I approach a seller, I never disappoint. They know that I know what I'm talking about, right? That I've done my research on their asset, the business, the market, and I'm serious about what I'm talking about, right? One thing, you, one way you can do that is if you approach a seller and say, hey, I want you to do a subject to deal, right? They don't even know what you're talking about most of the time, right? Loan assumption, I can approach somebody who owns a, a, a $1.5 million portfolio and say, hey, I'm going to assume you're dead on this deal. I'm going to do a loan assumption. And that's terminology that really connects with them. So I want you guys to really do your research on the business. If you want to join a, an education group, if you want to grab some books, all of them, right? Don't ask what, what one book changed your life. All of them changed my life. Read all of them, right? Learn the terminology of a sophisticated investor. So that can help you approach investors as well and approach sellers, right? I, I just wanted to give that little piece of information, that terminology, right? The subject two is really for just single family. You're not going to do a subject two. You can't even do subject two on, on conventional loans 90% of the time. Like it's in your mortgage documents. So a lot of you folks are talking about a single family or a duplex. Now, those are good deals. You got to get started. But one thing that I did very early, my first deal was an eight unit. I, I didn't even buy a house until I owned about 30 units, right? My next home that I bought, my second home, I had already owned, I, was, I owned a 200 doors, my second home, right? So I'm not even a huge believer in the single family home, right? If you don't have anything else, you better own your house at least and start paying that down. But you guys want to learn the terminology of a sophisticated investor so you can approach these sellers and impress them, right? That's really what gets deals done. You sit down with somebody and you start talking to them as if you've been in the business and you understand what you're talking about, they're going to give you the time of day. Well, I think it's just like any other uh, field, right? Be a beginner, yep. then you move to intermediate level and eventually get to an expert level. It just takes some time. But yeah, but we do offer, we do that, the limited partner course that we did the pilot on, which we went over a lot of terminologies, a lot of how to do the due diligence. So terminology yeah, was a big you know, portion of that. But yeah, I like to say it's because a lot of us are, are professionals and, and healthcare providers. It's just like we in medical school, we had to learn the language anyone, first. Yeah. <laughs> Any profession, you have to learn the lingo. And that way you can have meaningful conversations and at least get the respect of the person who's you're sitting across. Josh, I had a question about maybe creative ways of getting into some of these distressed deals. And that's not necessarily buying it outright and getting the equity but maybe coming in either as preferred um, equity, um, like rescue capital, or even preferred or rescue debt, like these debt funds that I'm seeing pop up all, the, all around. Because some of these, I think I've heard that some of these sellers are going to try their hardest not to give up these deals. And 
not to lose money for their investors. So they're going to try everything they can to stay in these deals, capital calls, um, you know, bringing in third party debt and diluting their investors a little bit just to save the deal. So just wanted to see if you or anyone else can speak on that a little bit as a, a potential strategy of getting in some of these deals. 100%. When you're talking about, and this goes back to that distress that we've been talking about, George, over and over. Follow the distress, follow the breadcrumbs. So the big guys, the big dogs, right? The, the guys who own 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 doors, they're opening up debt funds, right? They're well capitalized already. Their deals are in trouble too, but they've got sufficient capital, right? They've got single, single check strokers who can give them multiple million dollars, right? They're not necessarily dependent on the retail investor like you all, right? So what they're doing, they're using some of that capital to open up debt funds. Their hope is number one, hey, you lose your, they're going to go to a syndicator, right? The smaller syndicator who raise money from retail investors, right? And they're going to go to them and say, hey, look, I've got this debt fund. I will give you capital. It's highly interest. It's almost impossible for you to perform. But if you do perform, you keep your deal. If you don't perform, guess who gets the deal? Who's already got 10 to 40,000 doors under their management. And that's a strategy for them to acquire in 2024. So watch that happen a lot in 2024. A lot of groups who kept their deal in 2023 had no business keeping their deal, was able to pay for their, their interest rate cap through a debt fund. And then in 2024, they're going to lose their deal. They're going to lose their deal. If they would have just made it another 12 months into 2025, they probably would have been able to be okay, but they won't be able to perform and they'll lose it. Now, the guys who can perform with the debt fund that gave them the capital for their um, interest rate cap, they're just going to limp. They're going to limp. They're going to be hurt. Their investors may not get exactly what they were promises, promised, but they'll be okay. They'll be able to refinance in 2025, 2026, and they'll be able to keep their deal. So that's what you're going to, that's just me forecasting. Do I know that for sure? Of course not. But I know a lot of guys who have debt funds that own 30,000 units. And this is literally what they're saying. Hey, either they're going to perform and we'll make a bunch of interest or number two, they won't perform and their deal will just roll into our portfolio and our system. And exactly. we'll so I want to just add to that because I'm part of a syndication mentoring club where it's just what I call, what we call Main Street investors. And Main Street investors are starting these debt funds as well. So this is not just exclusive to these high ticket you know, institutions. You can syndicate a debt fund just like you can syndicate an actual apartment deal. It's just pooling of capital and that capital has to go to work somewhere. So there's guys in my syndication mentoring club that are literally banding together and tapping into their communities and they're explaining and educating how this works, you can get into these really good deals by coming in on these debt fund side. You don't have to go in on the equity side. You can come in as preferred equity. You can come in as a debt and that can all be syndicated as well. So just want to throw that out there. For sure. And this is, and the reason that they're doing that, right, is because if you're already in the game and you've been investing, you have to go against some of your um, fundamentals in order to continue to, to buy right now. So you'll see some large groups who own several thousand units that just pencil it down. Like they're just not buying. They don't care. It's just against our fundamentals. It's not how we got here and we're not going to jeopardize what we have to go to the next level right now. It doesn't make any sense. So they're just hanging on. They're going to do debt funds. They're going to do some different, um, some unique investments, but it is a great time to get started. So if any of you guys are like, hey, I haven't started yet, or I'm newer into the space, I have two units or I have a hundred units. This is a great time to get started, to go to the next level, right? Because there is a lot of distress in the market. But if you already started and you have a huge portfolio, why would you jeopardize anything? It doesn't make any sense, right? But it is a great time to get started. Yeah. I also want to comment on the debt fund. I know you talk about having a debt fund to save other failing equity firms, right? Small equity firms. I actually see it used more, in my opinion, try to save their own deal also. So I seem like almost every kind of mid-tier, even like ours, so small to moderate level, we have 880, 81 units right now. So we see people that with the same range also raising debt fund. So what we're thinking is the fact that they're using that as a backup capital in a way. 
But I always think it's also risky in a way that if you fail both the real estate and the debt fund in terms of returning the investors' money, then you absolutely capitulated. You're done, <laughs> right? But they were hoping that, like you said, if they can just survive 2024, almost every analyst predicted by after election year or even towards the end of election, there should be some move, hopefully in the right direction in terms of interest rates and the markets. They might start cutting rates or at least stabilize the rates. But yeah, so we also think of it as a way for people to save, potentially save their own deals too. 100%. You got to survive. What I've been hearing, I'm sure George has heard this too. I think I heard it on the Old Capital podcast, Survive Until 2025. But everybody, <laughs> if you were in the space and you got deals and you're doing this full time, you've heard that. Survive until 2025. We're all going to see something change in 2025. Do we know what it is? We do not know exactly what's that, what that's going to be. But we think that's going to soften up on the interest rates. We think some of the interest rate caps are going to be a little bit less expensive. And it's going to be easier to transact. That's what everybody's doing. But in the meantime, I implore all of you guys to, you know, find the distress. If you didn't hear anything else on this phone call, it's get closer proximity to the distress. Find it, sniff it out, go hunt for it. But it's not always going to be somebody selling a deal for, they're not going to list it 20% less, right? <laughs> it's not going to happen. You have to find the distress. You have to find the motivation. And that's your job if you want to be an active investor. If you want to be a passive investor and invest alongside of our group or Bio has some other deals he's rolling out, he's raising some capital on, those guys have already done the work, right? They've sniffed out the distress. They see the business plan. They see the value add. They've got loan assumptions. Yeah, definitely go either partner with an experienced group or you yourself go out there and find distress. Uh, Wes has a question. You can come on, Wes, if you want to. He wants you to list it. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, I wanted to hear his thoughts on best tips for finding the distress. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, the my my number one way that I've been finding distress lately is just finding somebody who may not be operating efficiently, right? Sometimes it is the physical distress that I'm seeing. I'm physically driving deals, I'm seeing it. I see they haven't really performed like they plan to. Like I've transacted on a lot of deals. So I know what their business plan was. I was a part of a lot of webinars for the deals that I'm in the markets that I'm in and that I'm that I look for deals in. So I know what their business plan was. So when I check back a couple of years later and I see them not executing on that business plan, right? All right, I need to make a phone call. I need to send a text. I need to send them an email and figure out, hey, would you be interested in possibly selling your property? That's one way I've been doing that and figuring out, hey, what, what's your motivation to sell right now? Just having conversations, right? I've talked to my latest deal that I have that I'm underwriting like crazy right now. I just text the property manager. It wasn't even their current property manager. It's somebody they fired, right? But they fired them because they weren't performing well. It wasn't because the property manager, it was because their business plan they went into the deal with that the property manager couldn't live up to, right? I just, the most recent deal that I purchased was through an attorney, all right? Local attorney, had a deal. I knew he wasn't an operator. Hey, would you be interested in selling a deal? Yeah, actually ended up doing some owner financing. So tapping into the local context, the boots on the ground, it doesn't always have to be you, Wes. Like you're a broker. People, when they hear your voice or they see your, phone, your, your name come across the phone, they're going to automatically think, oh man, just another realtor calling me or it's a realtor call. Sometimes send somebody else. Go through, you. even though you're a broker, send another broker if you got a deal. If they already have a relationship, they do. Let's go split a fee. You go reach out to them. We'll split the fee, whatever fee you can negotiate. I got a client who wants to buy or I want to buy, just whatever. Property manager, send them on a mission. Attorney, send them. CPA, send them. So get in contact with those local folks who already have the relationship. And so the, the last thing you want to do is feel seen. If you have distress, the last thing you want somebody to do is a shark to approach you, right? You want somebody who is already has a relationship with them. Hey, I got somebody who may be interested in buying your property, or I have somebody who has a client that will buy your property. Let me make an introduction, right? Like, just imagine if you were in some financial distress and some dude says, hey, I want, I want to buy your property for 20% less than what you think you could sell it for. 
you just feel seen. Like it doesn't even feel good. But as opposed to somebody that has a relationship with them, hey, look, I know a situation you're going through. Here's an opportunity. Look at this opportunity. I would say hearing that I hear networking because that's the layer above the actual seller who's in distress. And a great way to network is to start going to local meetup events. I know there's events that I go to where this is where the, the people in the ecosystem just congregate and you start developing relationships with the lenders, the brokers, the property managers, so they know who you are, what you're looking for, and they make that connection. So that would be something I think every one of us can do. We can just find the local meetups, start attending them regularly, start getting comfortable with the lingo, and just start having conversations. 100%, 100%. And one thing that I would say in a lot of ways, and this is a whole different podcast, but the way that we network and that we're trained to network is we get in, we exchange cards and we start telling people what we want. They tell us what they want. And we, that's just not an efficient way to network anyway. Right. Like the way me and bio met bio used to send, used to make offers on my deals and he would never get any of them. He would make offers all the time and just didn't get any of them. 20% back discounts. <laughs> we started the way that me and bio started doing deals together is he figured out what my real intention was and what my real goal was. And we've been doing deals ever since. It just in a different sense, right? I started bringing him the distress deal. It didn't even, I wasn't sending it to my clients. I started sending it to bio. Next, we're doing deals together, right? So even when you're going out there and networking, make sure you understand what, the, what matters to the other person and actually provide a level of service to them. Like just yesterday, I had two guys that I was texting simultaneously. And I actually connected them, right? They're probably going to do five to $10 million worth of transactions. And I won't get anything out of it. Nothing. I don't even care. I don't want a broker's fee. I don't want to be a part of the deal. Hey, I just want to connect two great guys. Y'all take the conversation from here. I hope y'all connect. They're meeting on Monday. The dude's got like 40 duplex lots. And I guarantee you they do a deal. Figure out how you can get proximity to those people by giving a level of service. And it's going to come back around to you somehow, some way. All that social capital right there. Being so, a connector, you just made some social capital and that can come back to you in the future. They'll remember you. Both sides will remember that you connected them. That's huge. Yes. Always find a way to provide value. 100%. And uh, so someone is asking if Joshua and George on LinkedIn. Yes, they're both on LinkedIn. You can you look up. Maybe George can actually post. Yeah, <laughs> I'll put my handle. And, uh, and then Josh. Well, question for Josh. In terms of last time we had a, this kind of discussion about finding the deal, you mm -hmm. talked about list source, which is what we use to find like the list of all the commercial brokers and all the, sorry, all the owners, right? Mm -hmm. For all the properties in a certain area. And how do you think you can use some of these? Because for me, I'm trying to automate it in a way. <laughs> no, you have to do the social networking and uh, talk to people. I know you're doing the acquisitions, but I'm just trying to see somebody out there who want to do it on their own somehow. So how can they use such a list? Yeah. Uh, so if you know. can pull a list that basically connects with the local county data and can find some multifamily opportunities. I used list source when I first started. I don't know if that's still a thing. Today I've stepped it up. I use CoStar, LoopNet, there's Yardi out there. These are all things that you have to pay for though. So you definitely want to try to find the least expensive option to find owners, but that's just the first step. Like how do you automate it? The only way you can really automate it is if you have some kind of mailing system in place, right? You create all your mailers, you create a system of the touches one to six, you create six postcards and you actually have somebody or some service sending these postcards out on a, on a regular basis. If you're going to do a weekly, monthly bi-weekly, whatever. They just know to send out this specific postcard, right? I've done that, right? I've done it on my own. I remember having my little slow HP printer that would pay, print one page, one color page every four minutes because it was such low resolution. I've done all that stuff, right? The number one way to find deals right now today is through brokers, through those local contacts and networking. But if you want to do some stuff on your own, pull a list, get some mailers, create them in Canva, Canva's free. If you guys wanted to know, so you could pull a list and may cost you a couple hundred bucks. You can make your postcards for free. They're not going to look great. Or you can do just letters, right? You could do handwritten letters. You can actually type a letter and hand sign it. 
There's so many things you can do, you guys. Just figure out how you can get in contact and just let people know that you're a buyer if they have a property they want to sell. That's how you can do it. That's very good. Awesome. Josh, we appreciate all the knowledge. This was great conversation to have. This was great discussion. We have another hour. I know, right? We could keep going. There's so much stuff going on. I totally agree with you that these periods of general economic distress are the greatest money transfer periods. And it's, I agree with you 100%. Like now is the time to really get active learning and networking and, and taking action, calculated action. You, but this, these are the times when wealth transfer happens. And this is a big one. There's so much debt in the system. There's so much change that's going to come because of that high leverage that we're going to see massive wealth transfer. So I love that point for this hour that we spent. That was great. Yeah. I just answered a question for Luke in the chat for a book recommendation. If you want to get familiar with the terminology, Joe Fairless best ever syndication book. It's a long, big old fat book but it gives you every single piece. It's like an encyclopedia more than a book, right? Tells you about syndication, tells you all the terminology, loan assumptions, debt, debt, cap rates. If you just want to get a very good understanding of how to, what, what all this stuff means, right? And how it affects your business in the syndication space, definitely read that book. Awesome. I actually haven't read it myself, so I'm going to put a copy, it. bro. Don't buy it. We <laughs> read it from my office. Don't buy it. Okay, no problem. <laughs> it so happens to be in one of our offices. <laughs> that's still give, can still give them some support. <laughs> Joe Fairless, <laughs> you can give them some support. Hey, every dollar counts. Rent it up, buy look at it. Five bucks a day. Rent it for me. If you, want to. <laughs> <laughs> you can give Josh some support. <laughs> oh, man. That's man. I really appreciate it taking the time, man, to always educate us. And you you, you pay forward a lot. And I like that. I've sent a lot of people to Josh <laughs> randomly. Somebody bothering me or uh, asking me questions about, I want to acquire and things like that. I'm like, this is guy. And he just suddenly show up at Josh's place. I'll be back. <laughs> I'll, be back um, I'll be back on November 11th to talk about the asset management side. Once you get a deal uh, and it's not coming from, it's not going to come from a place that I know everything, right? Because I learn stuff from Bio and George every week. We have a call every week and I take something back to my team and I hire somebody new to fill the hole that I fit, I feel after I get off the call with them. Like, oh, shoot, I didn't know that. Or shoot, I'm missing something and I need to hire somebody else to help me with that. So asset management, we're going to be talking about that on November 11th. Um, so excited to be back in a couple of weeks. Yep. yep. Well, Looking forward to it. Yep. For sure. Yeah. The days that you say, oh, I, I finished learning. That's when you start getting dumb worried. Dumb. That's when you start getting worried. Like, yeah, I know, right? So, yeah, we love it. We love you on the team and collaborating. Do you have anything else to add? Anybody has any more questions? Because we're already a little bit. All right, awesome. Yeah, we can talk. We can talk. We're going to talk about it on November 11th, asset management. So, I don't have anything else. I appreciate you guys. Always okay. a blessing to be able to just pay it forward and give people information. And Bio will be putting out clips and I'm sure he'll put the interview back or the podcast out for you guys to rewatch it later. So I appreciate yep. it. Thank you, Josh. Take care, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks, everyone.